one. This one's called International Law. Copies of these documents can be found in my private group at Yahoo called Administering Your Public Servants. I have YouTube videos that are videos of private information shares that are show these and other court citations that are available for donations. Uh, donations to support this work are appreciated. And this last paragraph is actually for the uh, all of Satanist order follower revenue officers operating in their private capacity under the Federal Tax Lien Act of 1966 because they can put their privileges and benefits up the rectal orifice. I prefer a gold or silver coin. But as an extremely less desirable alternative, I can accept the commercial paper, the IOUs, the Federal Reserve notes, the PayPal gifts, the checks, money orders, etc. Send me an email for particulars. Um... Anyways, this uh, papal bull Dum Diversus was issued in 18th of June, 1452. I always suspected that the Roman cult, matter of fact, I've even talked about it in my videos, that they, how they're responsible for the slave trade. And this is proof right here. Uh, Pope Nicholas V issued the papal bull Dum Diversus on 18th of June, 1452. It authorized Alfonso V of Portugal to reduce any Saracens and pagans, Saracens are Muslims, and pagans, and any other unbelievers to perpetual slavery. This facilitated the Portuguese slave trade to West Af from West Africa. The same pope wrote the bull Romanus Pontifex on January 5th, 1455, to the same Alfonso. As a follow-up of the Dum Diversus, it extended to the Catholic nations of Europe dominion over discovered lands through during the Age of Discovery. Along with sanctifying the seizure of non-Christian lands, it encouraged the enslavement of native non-Christian peoples in Africa and the New World. We weighing all the singular, the premises with due mediation and noting that since we have formerly by other letters of ours granted, among other things, free and ample faculty to the aforesaid kings Alfonso to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Sarsens and pagans whatsoever and other enemies of Christ wheresoever placed in the kingdoms. Actually, that's enemies of the Roman cult. And actually, that's even heretics, okay, because that's exactly, you know, the way they do things. Um, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors the kingdoms and dukedoms and counties, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods, and to convert them to his and their use and profit. By having secured the said faculty, the said King Alfonso, or by his authority, the said infant, uh, justly and lawfully has acquired and possessed and doth possess these islands, lands, harbors, and seas, and they do of right belong and pertain to the said King Alfonso and his successors. In 1493, Alexander VI issued the bull Inter Serrera, stating that one Christian nation did not have the right to establish dominion over lands previously dominated by another Christian nation, thus establishing the law of nations. So, so uh, uh, the Roman cult uh, uh, is responsible for the slave trade, the law of nations, and, and the law of nations, and, and that's a subset of canon law. Together with Dum de Versus, the Roman Pontifex and the Inter Serrera came to serve as the basis and justification for the doctrine of discovery, the global slave trade of the 15th and 16th centuries, and the age of imperialism. And this is a book called The Lines of Demarcation of Pope Alexander VI, um, which is taken, which is from the Transactions of the Royal Society of Canada and is published in 1899. And on um, page 471, it says, If therefore we put aside the conventional law or treaty law of nations, um, it will be seen that modern international law is founded on the Roman law and on the canon law, which latter was carried over all Europe by the Roman Church. For even in England, up until the time of Edward III, the Lord Chancellor was always a Roman cult, okay, ecclesiastic. And, uh, and in fact, we talk about that in the um, definition of a Sestake Trust. And this is Alberto Gentili. He was an um, uh, Italian lawyer and jurist, recognized as the founder of science of international law. Gentile is perhaps one of the most influential people in the legal education ever to have lived. He's one of three men referred to as the father of international law. Gentile is the earliest writer on public international law and the first person to split secularism from canon law um, and Roman Catholic theology. And it's interesting, uh, 14, 1552 to 1608, and this um, uh, 
uh, was in 1452 to 1498. So it wasn't long after these, this dumb diversus and intersurera and all this other stuff happened. And uh, then they started writing about it. And if you go on, it says Gentili held at the bottom here, the Gentili held the Regis professorship until his death, when, but he turned more and more to practical work in London from about 1590. He practiced in the High Court of Admiralty, where the continental civil law rather than the English common law was applied. And, and I got to tell you, I've seen, I read books about talk about German common law, about common law of France, about common law of, of Belgium uh, and, and Denmark and Russia even. And so the point being is, is that what they've done is they've taken this admiralty and converted the common law by way of admiralties by way of contracts and converted it all to, uh, to get converted God-given rights into um, government-granted rights, okay? In other words, satanic privileges. It's exactly what it is. This is taken from the Statute of International Law Commission, 1947. The UN was set up in 1945, so two years later they come out with this. The International, this is Article 1. The International Law Commission shall have for its object the promotion of the progressive development and international of international law and its codification. The Commission shall concern itself primarily with public international law, but is not precluded from entering the field of private international law. And this is the Hague Conference on Private International Law Convention concerning the International Administration of Estates of Deceased Persons. Uh, matter of fact, let's get in closer. Um, and it talks about an international certificate. And I think it's the birth certificate. It doesn't actually come out and say it in here. But uh, when you read it, you'll see. We'll go through some sections, some articles here. Anyways, it notices that you got the, the little one there up by the title, Convention Concerning International Administration of Estates of, estates of Deceased Persons. And there's a little uh, one. And then there's a, a Chapter 1, International Certificate. Article 1, the contracting state shall establish an international certificate designating the person or persons entitled to administer the movable estate of a deceased person and indicating his or their powers. The certificate is drawn up in the contracting state designated in Article 2 in accordance with the model annexed to this convention and shall be recognized in the contracting states. And so then if you go to the bottom of the page, that little footnote 1, that's what it means. The convention, including related materials, is accessible on the website of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. Uh, anyways, and it goes on, Article 22, and this is why I think it's a birth certificate. It's obviously a birth certificate. Why would anybody be a holder otherwise of the certificate? Any person who pays or delivers property to the holder of the certificate drawn up and where necessary recognized in accordance with this convention shall be discharged unless unless uh, it is proved that the person acted in bad faith. And that's Article 22, all right? So then why would you be a holder of a certificate except that it was a birth certificate? Any person who has acquired assets of the estate from the holder of a certificate drawn up and were necessary recognized in accordance with this convention shall, unless it is proved that he acted in bad faith, be deemed to have acquired them from a person have power to dispose of them. That's Article 23. And so um, that's exactly, in my opinion, um, where it's going. And this is a convention on the law applicable to trusts and their recognition. This is concluded 1st of July, 1985. This is just a couple. I, the point I want to make is that, um, first of all, it's it's... It's, it exists, it's under international law, and, um, and um, it's entered into force on 1st of January 1992, and, uh, and then at the bottom in the footnotes it says, done at the Hague on the first day of uh, July 1985, in English and French, both texts being equally authentic, in a single copy which shall be deposited in the archives of the government of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and of which a certified copy shall be sent through diplomatic channels, to each of the state's members of the Hague Conference in private international law. So, again, this is talking about trusts, okay? And so it talks about the uh, um, um, different kinds of trusts in here, too. Uh, anyways, um, Unidroit, okay? This is private law, okay? Remember, we're talking, uh, it's the, uh, the um, International Law Commission, 
can uh, can deal with private international law, which is Unidroit is private international law. Unidroit stands for the unification of private law, and the website says that 63 countries have adopted it. It's designated to be automatically implemented. Canada and the United States have been signatories for over 30 years. Unidroit website says it was designed to be automatically implemented. In other words, the uh, they make a change, and all the changes filter down through all the countries that signed on to it. And this is... Um, the web page talks about commercial contracts, cultural property, franchising, and uh, and uh, then there's another page here. This was in 2014 when I printed this off, uh, but an over, overview, Unidroit International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, uh, leasing, security interests, transports, banking law, capital markets, it's all under Unidroit. Um, Civil procedure, contracts, cultural property, franchising, hotel keepers, insurance, intellectual property, leasing, legal status of women, maintenance obligations, movement of persons, negotiable instruments. Okay, that ties into the banking law. Civil procedure, that ties into the court, civil liability. Um, and this is the uh, uh, 1955 Benelux Treaty on compulsory insurance against civil liability in respect of motor vehicles. Uh, 1958 conventions uh, concerning the contract and enforcement of decisions related to maintenance obligations towards children. 1959 convention on compulsory insurance against civil liability in respect of motor vehicles. And these are some of the major states. It's not all of them, but I just want to show that Australia is in it, Canada, most of the South American, and most of Europe, actually. United uh, Kingdom, United States, China. Uh, anyways... And now a little diversion. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Don't forget to click the bell next to the subscribe button so you're notified when there's a new upload. And here's my channel. The arrow is pointing at the bell. When you click the bell, a little pop-up will come up, and you'll have to check a box and click OK to, uh, to be notified about uploads. Uh, this is the um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 1. Uh, clause 3, uh, Clause 1 and 3. Actually, all peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they're freely determined their political status. And, and the state parties shall promote the realization of the right of self-determination. That's very important. And then uh, Article 2, Clause 1. It says each state party to the present covenant undertakes to respect to ensure all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction the rights recognized in the present covenant without distinction of any kind such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. All of this is under Roman cult. This is all Roman cult, Roman law. And under Roman law, status is everything. Under common law, status is nothing. Okay, so this is a cheap imitation of rights. These are government-granted rights is what this is. Uh, anyways, Article 2, Clause 2. Uh, we're not already provided by existing legislative or other measures. Each state party to the present covenant undertakes to take the necessary steps in accordance with its constitutional processes and with the provisions of the present covenant to adopt such laws or other measures as may be necessary to give effect to the rights recognized in the present covenant. Article 2, Clause 3. Each state party to the present covenant undertakes uh, to ensure any person whose rights or freedoms is here unrecognized or violated shall have an effective remedy, notwithstanding that the violation has been committed by persons acting in an official capacity, to ensure that any person claiming such a remedy shall have his right thereto determined by competent judicial, administrative, or other legislative authorities, and then to ensure that the competent authorities shall enforce such remedies when granted. And um, Article 3, um, State parties to the present covenant undertake to ensure that all equal right of men and women. Okay, and so uh, they're going to assault everybody. Article 16: Everyone shall have the right to recognition everywhere as a person. Okay, so they're going to assault you uh, with their person. Uh, the death of London, uh, London's Roman Empire by Lyndon H. LaRouche Jr. Okay, and this is a, a blog article I found, and um, and uh, again it comes down to the Roman Empire has moved into London. And I think we already know that anyways. This is Article 15. No one shall be held guilty of a criminal offense on account of any act or omission which does not constitute a criminal offense uh, at the time it was committed. Um, and then another little diversion, announcing a subscription-based YouTube channel called Sovereignty International. The recommended cost of the subscription is currently $1.99 a month because it avoids the advertising only. The only power that these New World Order Satanists have over us is through fraud and deception, and my agenda is to expose it all. And so 
I was originally planning on having exclusive content on that channel, but I can't think of anything that I want to have on there exclusively. And so, I'm, you know, I do have an Arlington private information share that's on there exclusively, but, you know, it really doesn't have anything that's in on any other private information share, quite frankly. But uh, so um, if you want to make a $1.99 a month donation, it is certainly appreciated. It's modest, I agree, but uh, every little bit helps. You know, you get a little bit from a lot of people, and it adds up pretty fast. And so every little bit helps. It's appreciated. And uh, for that reason, I'm not going to – I can't guarantee there will be anything exclusive on the channel. The um, – the ex the, you know, I might put something on there exclusively, but I my agenda is to expose these Satanists. I'm currently publishing five videos a week. My YouTube channel, uh, people had trouble finding it, so I put a link at the bottom of the page. I've also got a link at the top of this one where the top red arrow is pointing to. Also, uh, some people uh, sent me $1.99, and, you know, I was wondering if that was a donation for uh, or for wanting me to sign them up. And uh, i got to say that I have no control over the subscribers. I sent them an email to that effect and uh, they haven't responded. I offered to refund it if they wanted me to sign them up. Um, they haven't responded. Um, the, um, if you want to sign up, the only way you can do it is start free trial. It's indicated by the bottom arrow. I have no control over the subscribers. Um, I can't even see some of the subscribers. So um, I have no control over that at all. Um, anyways, and so back to the topic at hand, everyone, this is, uh, again, the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, Article 18. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of conscience, thought, and religion, and uh, no one shall be subject to coercion, uh, would impair his freedom or have or adopt a religion or belief of his choice. And, um, and this is Article 4, or I should say Article, Paragraph 4 of Article 18. The state parties to the present covenant undertake to have respect for the liberty of parents when applicable to legal guardians to ensure religious and moral education of their children in conformity with their own convictions. And this is Article 24. Every child shall have without race uh, 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 any discrimination as to race, color, sex, language, religion, national or social origin, property or birth, the right to such measures of protection as required by his status as a minor. Okay, again, a status. Okay, this is all Roman law. These are inferior civil rights that are being granted here, and they're useless, in my opinion. You want common law rights, rights granted by God. This is Article 26. All persons are equal before the law and, ent and entitled without any description, uh, discrimination to equal protection of the law. Um, and um, the... Um, the... Um, Equal and effective protection against discrimination on any ground such as uh, um, um, race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national, social origin, property, birth, or other status. And so, um, and uh, and the and this is Article 26, and uh, it goes on. In those states in which ethnic, religious, or linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minorities shall not be denied the right to, in community with other members of their group, to enjoy their own culture to profess, practice their own religion, to use their own language. And so, and now a little diversion, cubeyard.com. For great custom websites, domain names, and hostings, go to cubeyard.com. Use coupon code CY172 for 20% off your first order. Cubeyard.com, your source for websites, domain names, and hosting. And so, we've been talking about uh, uh, basically international documents. Well, uh, the international law rule applies in America, too. Okay, this is taken from jurisdiction over federal areas within the states. Report of the Interdepartmental Committee for the Study of Jurisdiction over Federal Areas within the States, Part 2. A text of the law of legislative jurisdiction submitted to the Attorney General and transmitted to the President June 1957. And that's page 158 through 165. And so this is... The international law rule adopted for areas under federal legislative jurisdiction federalizes state civil law, including common law. And actually what it means is that all state statutes are actually federal statutes. The rule serves to federalize not only the statutory but the common law of a state. State and federal venue discussed. The civil law is effective in an area of exclusive federal jurisdiction or federal law, notwithstanding their derivation from state laws. And a cause arising under such laws may be brought in or removed to federal district court, etc., uh, etc. Et okay. Anyways, the point being, 
is that the uh, uh, international law applies in in America too, okay, and uh, in the states, okay, and and you think it doesn't apply to you? Well, listen to this. This is National Mutual Insurance Company of the District of Columbia versus Tidewater Transfer Company, U.S. Supreme Court, 1948. We therefore decline to overrule the opinion of Chief Justice Marshall. We hold that the District of Columbia is not a state within Article 3 in the Constitution. In other words, cases between citizens of the district and those of the states were not included in the catalog of controversies over which Congress could give jurisdiction to the federal courts by virtue of Article 3. In other words, Congress has exclusive legislative jurisdiction over citizens of Washington District of Columbia and through their plenary power. Okay, that's military dictatorship folks nationally covers those citizens even one of the one of the several states as though the district expands for the purpose of regulating its citizens wherever they go throughout the states of the union and so again if you're a u.s citizen in texas then the international law rule applies okay it's u.s law all persons born or naturalized in the united states and subject to the jurisdictions of our citizens of the united states that's the 14th amendment and see the so-called 14th Amendment is unconstitutional video, U.S. citizens are enemies of the state. A U.S. citizen is Roman law, is Roman cult. A citizen of the United States is a civilly dead entity operating as co-trustee and co-beneficiary of the Public Charitable Trust, the constructive Sestake Trust of U.S. Inc. under the 14th Amendment, which upholds the debt of USA and U.S. Inc. And that's a summary of five pages of congressional record on June 13, 1967. Every taxpayer is a Sestake trust, having sufficient interest in preventing the abuse of the trust to be recognized in the field of this court's prerogative jurisdiction. That's Henry Bolin's 1912. So if you're paying taxes, you're a Sestake trust or they've got you into a contract. Slater's protestations to the effect that he derives no benefit from the United States government having have, um, have no bearing on his legal obligation to pay income taxes. Unless the defendant can establish that he is not a citizen of the United States, the IRS possesses authority to determine his federal tax liability. And, you know, the way you do it is you, an affidavit, okay? But anyways, they're nothing but a bunch of thieves anyways. This is an act to establish a code of law for the District of Columbia, uh, Chapter 56, Section 1617, located at 31 Stat 1432, and the legal estate to be in the Sestake use. This is, uh, again, an act to establish a code of law for the District of Columbia, March 3rd, 1901, uh, located at 31 Stat 1189. At 2, where it says, and be it further enacted, that in the interpretation and construction of said code, the following rules shall be observed, namely the word person shall be held to apply to partnerships and corporations. So it's a fictitious entity. And, and at uh, uh, Section uh, 252, Chapter 3, Section 252 at 31 Stat 1230, it talks about the presumption of death. And so, again, a Sestake trust is a dead thing. And so they can presume that you're dead based on this. This creates the presumption. And then uh, uh, Title 15, United States Code, Section 44, this is where it's codified. Definitions, corporation shall be deemed to include any company, trust, corporate, uh, Massachusetts trust or association incorporated or unincorporated, which is organized to carry on business for its own profit or that of its members, and has shares of capital stock or certificates of interest, and, and it basically goes to the same definition, but it says, and does not have shares of capital stock or certificates of interest. And so um, the point being is that when I went, when I filed a lawsuit, when I went to the Supreme Court the first time, that was... I was, that was what I brought up, is that they were converting my rights into privileges and they were assaulting me with this unincorporated corporation under Title 15, United States Code, Section 44. And the Department of So-Called Justice waived their right to respond. They admitted it. They said, okay, so what? We know about that. Anyways, did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? This is the Sestigay V Act. This is England, okay, of 1666. And this is, uh, uh, has gone beyond sea, and the revisioners can't find out whether they're alive or dead. And this is on page two. It says, um, remaining beyond the sea for seven years, together with no proof of their lives, judge in action to direct a verdict that those Sestigay V were dead. Okay, so in other words, 
when you convert yourself into this this birth certificate that's a badge of slavery okay and whether you're dead or alive you're still a slave okay and um and the person so remaining beyond years or otherwise absenting himself were dead, as if the person, okay, so the judge whom such action shall be brought, it's at the bottom, shall uh, direct the jury to give the verdict, as if the person so remaining beyond the seas or otherwise absenting himself were dead. Okay, so this is all such to gave e trust. This is Tomlin's Law Dictionary, 1835 edition, volume 2, under the definition of Mort Main. Yet still, it was found difficult to set bounds to ecclesiastical ingenuity, that's Roman cult folks, for when they were driven out of their former holds, they devised a new method of conveyance by which the lands were granted not to themselves directly, but to nominal fiafis, to the use of the religious houses, thus distinguishing between the possession and the use, and receiving the actual profits while a season of the land remained in the nominal fiafi who was held by the courts of equity, then under the direction of the clergy to be bound in conscience to account to assist K use, which is the Roman cult, folks, um, for the rents and emoluments of the estate. That's, that's taxes. And it is to these inventions that our practitioners are indebted for the introduction of uses and trusts, the foundation of modern conveyancing. That's why every taxpayer is a K trust. And that's uh, uh, and it was the modern uh, modern conveyancing in 1835. It's still a modern conveyancing today. The Roman cult runs the courts, and it was run the cults courts then. It's still running the courts today. All persons are aliens are uh, are ancestors. All statutes are for foreign are for regulating aliens. All statutes are international law. All courts are dealing with international law. All judges. Fire, uh, fall under United Nations and United Nations treaties. They do. And now another little diversion. Uh, uh, Bankster, watch, check out my other videos. Bankster Thieves 1, 2, and 3. Roman Cult Slave Scam Series. Bankrupt Corporate So-Called Governments. Bar Members 1 through 3. Do It Yourself How Not to Volunteer for the Selective Service in the Draft. Martial Laws here. Do It Yourself No Income Tax. Do It Yourself No Sales Tax. Do It Yourself Traffic Stop. Do it yourself free mail. Do it yourself kangaroo courts, one through nine. Anyways, and so there's no common law crimes in the United States or D.C., uh, which is D.C. in the territories, actually. There's no common law offenses against the United States, only those acts which Congress has forbidden with penalties for, obedient, for disobedience to this command. Okay, So this is all Roman law. Under Texas, same thing. Roman law. Under Texas law, no act or omission is a crime unless made so by statute. Legislature may create an offense in the same enactment and provide exceptions to its application. No common law crimes. Everything's in admiralty. Remember we talked about how that, that, uh, that um, at the very beginning, that guy that was uh, Italian uh, was working in the courts of admiralty. Everything is in admiralty. The root of error doth not lie upon a sentence in the admiralty, but an appeal. And that's taken from Tomlin's Law Dictionary, 1835 edition, under the definition of admiralty. But it's citing Book 4 on the Institutes and the Laws of England, which uh, was Coke in the 1500s. Appeals are in admiralty. It's all called, it's a called a court of appeals because it is admiralty. It's the same thing that precipitated the War of Independence. This is the causes and necessities for taking up arms, 1775. Statutes have been passed extending the courts of admiralty and vice admiralty far beyond their ancient limits for depriving us of the custom and inestimable privilege of trial by jury in cases affecting both life and property to supersede the course of common law and instead thereof to publish and order the use and exercise of the law marshal. And for altering fundamentally the form of government established by charter, we saw the misery to which such despotism would reduce us. That's military dictatorship, and that's exactly what it is. It's martial law. And this is actually uh, taken from a non-ratification of the 14th Amendment by Judge A.H. Ella to the Utah Supreme Court in his case, Diet versus Turner. And he says the same thing, only a little bit different. He says, in the meantime, civil law was the form of law imposed in the Roman Empire, which was largely, if not wholly, governed by martial law rule. If equity has always been understood to follow the law, to have superior equity is to turn things on their head. This is exactly what happens when martial law is imposed. If equity is the law, then it follows its own course rather than following the common law, thereby destroying the common law and leaving what's called equity in its place. And that's martial law, right? And to supersede common law. 
and uh, and that's why these bell priests, when you go into their kangaroo court, they'll tell you, I can do anything I want in here. And he's right, because because they don't have to follow common law. A penal action. So now we're going to talk about penal. Okay, some words. And everything is words. Um, a penal action is an action on a penal statute, an action for recovery of penalty given by statute, where an action is founded entirely on a statute, and the only object is the recovery of penalty or forfeiture. Such action is a penal action as in texas penal code okay look in your state okay is it a penal code uh, regardless of whether it is or not uh, i guarantee you there's penalties <laughs> the words penal and penalty in their strict and primary sense denote a punishment whether corporal or pecuniary imposed and enforced by the state for a crime or offense okay i guarantee you there's offenses every state has offenses and, and Canada, okay? It's all offenses. This is all commerce. This is all under unidroit. The noun penalty is defined forfeiture or to be forfeited for noncompliance with an agreement, okay? The words forfeit and penalty are substantially synonymous. This is all falling under unidroit and the international law. A penal action is one founded entirely on statute. The only object is to recover a penalty or forfeiture imposed as a punishment for a certain specific offense, while a remedial action is one which is brought to obtain compensation or indemnity. A penal action is a civil suit. Remember, okay, that's all um, admiralty. That's Roman law. Civil law, Roman law, Roman civil law, all in interchangeable. Brought uh, uh, for the recovery of a statutory forfeiture when inflicted as punishment for an offense against the public. Such actions are civil actions, on the one hand closely related to criminal prosecutions, on the other hand for private injuries in which a party may agree may by statute recover punitive damages. And so that's why when that bail priest, when you ask him, well, I'd like to know the nature of this cause, he'll tell you it's quasi-criminal. He doesn't want to tell you it's a lawsuit, okay, because uh, it's, they'll say it's quasi-criminal. Um, did you give up? Your God-given rights for some satanic privileges. This is U.S. Supreme Court. But individuals, when acting as representatives of a collective group, cannot be said to be exercising their personal rights and duties or nor be entitled to purely personal privileges. Rather, they assume the rights, duties, and privileges of the artificial entity or association of which they are agents or officers, and they are bound by its obligations. And so when you get up there, and they say, are you the name? And you say, yes, you just bought into it, okay? You just agreed to be the slave. And they sell you into slavery. It's all under Unidroit, and we're going there here in a second. This is the Uniform Commercial Code, Section 1-206. Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? Whenever the Uniform Commercial Code creates a presumption with respect to a fact or provides that a fact is presumed, the trier of fact must find the existence of the fact unless and until evidence is introduced that supports a finding of its non-existence. And what's evidence? There's not many things that are evidence, okay? An affidavit is evidence, um, and especially if they don't rebut it. Uh, but, but there's not many things that are actually evidence. And so um, a copy is hearsay, okay? If you don't, if you dispute it, then they can't admit it. It can't be introduced. Hearsay cannot be introduced as evidence uh, if you dispute it, okay? And so a copy is hearsay. I want to see the original. That's a copy. That's hearsay. I want to see the original. Might be. Might not. Um, anyways, um, Texas Business and Commerce Code, Section 3.308. That's the same thing as the Uniform Commercial Code, except it's in Texas. In an action with respect of an instrument, the authenticity of an authority to make each signature on the instrument are admitted unless specifically denied in the pleadings. If the validity of a signature is denied in the pleadings, the burden of establishing a validity is on the person making claiming validity, but the signature is presumed to be authentic and authorized. So the point being is, is that they just go ahead and forge your signature onto a contract. That's exactly what they do. And if you don't know that's what's going on, and if you don't deny the, uh, the, the validity of, uh, of the forgery, basically is what happens, then, uh, then uh, they just go ahead and railroad you. And that's exactly what happens. The, um, 
the um, uh, um, Carl Lentz successfully won, got his son back from child CPS, Child Protective Services pigs, with a one-page lawsuit, and one of the things he brought up was forgery. And, um, and so that's the point. Uh, the following rules apply in an action of a certificated security against the issuer unless specifically denied in the pleadings. Each signature on a security certificate or in a necessary endorsement is admitted. If the effectiveness of a signature is put in issue, the burden of establishing effectiveness is on the party claiming under the signature. But the signature is presumed to be genuine and authorized. And again, what they do is they forge your signature onto a contract, they certificate it, or I securitize it, I should say, and sell it on Wall Street. There's people that have found their criminal cases at Fidelity Investments. And they sell those things on Wall Street. And if you don't dispute, then then your signature is forged on there, and and that's it. If you don't know, that's what's going on. These Roman cult Satanist bar member whores masquerading as a judge forge your signature onto a contract and then presume it's authorized and authentic. Who's going to call a judge a liar? And he's not even a judge, but he's masquerading as a judge. That's how they're populating the prisons. Carl Lentz brought up the issue of the forgery against CPS when they stole his son in his successful one-page lawsuit, and he got his son back after 11 years. Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? See the Judicial Whores video. He, the convicted felon, has a as a consequence of his crime not only forfeited his liberty, but all his personal rights except those which the law uh, in his humanity affords him, for he is, for the time being, a slave of the state, okay? They are selling you into slavery. That's exactly what they're doing. The first thing these Satanists have to do is get rid of that pesky little common law problem because at common law, they would be put to death, okay? This is Deuteronomy 24 and 7. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren or the children of Israel and make merchandise of him or sell of him, then that thief shall die, thou shalt put evil away from among you. That's why they got all these Muslim... Uh, uh, um, refugees coming into the country, they want to get rid of common law. They want to get it permanently gone, okay? They want to dumb down the people to the point that, that there is no common law, and they want it permanently gone. It's time we started waking up to what's going on here. It's all about slavery. International law is a subset of canon law. International law started with the Roman cult. Unidroit stands for the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law. Unidroit is located 100 yards from the Holy See. Unidroit controls and governs the Uniform Commercial Code. Through Unidroit, the Roman cult has seized control of all courts. The Roman cult's bar members are already officers of all courts. See the bar members 1, 2, and 3 videos. The United Nations is owned and operated by the Crown and the Roman cult handlers. See, the crown is owned and operated by the Roman cult video. See, the United States is a crown colony, and the crown owns and operates the United Nations. One and two videos. See, a unidroit is coming from the United Nations. See, the Roman cult scam slave, uh, slave scam number one video. The United Nations maintains the international law collection, which is also coming from the Roman cult. They're also human the Rome, using the Roman cult's international law rule to assault us with their fraudulent, fictitious Sestake trust. That's exactly what's going on, folks. It's about time we waked up, or woke up, <laughs> waked up, right? Woke up to what's going on. This is the Vatican's Holocaust. You don't think they're going to murder people? They're doing it every day. The sensational account of the most horrifying religious massacre of the 20th century by Avro Manhattan, who was a Knight of Malta. Avro Manhattan lived from 1914 to 1990. Avro Manhattan was the world's foremost authority on Roman Catholicism and politics. A resident of London during World War II, he operated a radio station called Radio Freedom, broadcasting to occupied Europe. He was the author of over 20 books, including the bestseller The Vatican and World Politics, twice Book of the Month, and going through 57 editions. He was a Great Britain who risked his life daily to expose some of the darkest secrets of the papacy. His books were number one on the Forbidden Index for the past 50 years. And then it says uh, from 1986, uh, the record is now 70 years on the Forbidden Book List. Anyways, 
This is a preface to the American edition. The Vatican's Holocaust is not a misnomer, an accusation, or even less a speculation. It is a historical fact. Rabid nationalism and uh, religious dogmatism were its two main ingredients. During the existence of Croatia as an independent Catholic state, over 700,000 men, women, and children perished. Many were executed, tortured, died of starvation, buried alive, or were burned to death. Hundreds were forced to become Catholic. Catholic padres ran concentration camps. Catholic priests were officers of the military corps, which committed such atrocities. 700,000 in the total population of a few million proportionately would be as if one-third of the USA population had been exterminated by a Catholic militia. What has been gathered in this book will vindicate the veracity of these facts. Dates, names, places, as well as photos were, uh, are there to prove them. They should become known to the American public, not to foster vindictiveness, but to warn them of the danger which racialism and sectarianism, when allied with religious intolerance, can bring to any contemporary nation, whether in Europe or in the New World. The world should be assessed without prejudice as a lesson and even more vital as a warning for the future of Americans beginning with that of the USA. And that is Avril Manhattan's 1986 preface. Now, editor's note is uh, an arm to Syria could have easily, pre uh, Serbia could have easily prevented this Holocaust. Thank God for the Second Amendment to the Constitution, which guarantees the right to bear arms. Freedom of religion and an armed citizenry go hand in hand and is the only guarantee that this won't happen in the U.S. And another editor's note, it is the Vatican one world government that doesn't want you to have the right to own arms or to use any means to defend yourself. That is so true. And we need to wake up, folks. We need to take care of business. Civil law, Roman law, Roman civil law are convertible phrases meaning the same system of jurisprudence, that rule of action which every particular nation, commonwealth, or city has established peculiarly for itself, more properly called municipal law, distinguish it from the law of nature and from international law. And so that's Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. All of these international uh, uh, covenants, the UN, it's all municipal law. It's civil law. It's Roman law. It's Roman civil law. Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? They can't use treaties internally, okay? The, this is uh, the U.S. Supreme Court again, Mayor of New Orleans versus United States. The government of the United States is one of limited powers. It can access, uh, exercise authority over no subjects except those which have been delegated to it. Congress cannot, by legislation, enlarge the federal jurisdiction, nor can it be enlarged under the treaty-making power. And... Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? But Madison insisted that just because this power was given to Congress, it did not follow that the treaty power was absolute and unlimited. The President and the Senate lacked the power to dismember the empire. For example, because the exercise of the power must be consistent with the object of the delegation. The object of treaties in Madison's oft-repeated formulation is the regulation of intercourse with foreign nations and is external. That's U.S. Supreme Court, Bond versus United States, 2014. No treaty power internally. Today it is enough to highlight some of the structural and historical evidence suggesting that the treaty power can be used to enrage intercourse with other nations, but not to regulate purely domestic affairs. And again, that's Bond versus United States. See the No Treaty Power Inside USA video. Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? In Downs versus Bidwell, the dissenting opinion of Justice Marshall Harlan said, Two national governments exist, one to be maintained under the Constitution with all its restrictions, the other to be maintained by Congress outside and independently of that instrument. Why do you think that Nancy Pelosi, as Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, gets up and says that they have to pass legislation without reading it. That's obviously legislation for the D.C. and the territories. That's the two national governments. The one is for D.C. and the territories. The other one is for the United States of America. And there's very little out there that's for the United States of America. Did you give up 
your God-given rights for some satanic privileges. All of these statutes about religion of freedom are a cheap imitation of common law that essentially convert God-given rights into privileges. By this means, uh, citizens' birth rights become of no effect and their rights are reduced to the inferior character of statutory civil rights, which are mere legislative privileges, which is taken from the non-ratification of the 14th Amendment uh, by Judge A.H. Ellett in the case Diet versus Turner. At common law, they are absolute rights. Statutes can and are changed. Statutes are ignored under certain circumstances. History is clear that the first ten amendments to the Constitution were adopted to secure certain common law rights of the people against invasion by the federal government. Common law rights. Every citizen and freeman is endowed with certain rights and privileges to enjoy which no written law or statute is required. These are fundamental or natural rights recognized among all free people. The people are sovereign are not bound by general words and statutes restrictive of prerogative right, title, or interest unless expressly named. Acts of limitation do not bind the king or the people. The people have been ceded all the rights of the king, the former sovereign. Taxpayers are not state citizens. Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? State citizens are the only ones living under free government whose rights are incapable of impairment by legislation or judicial decision. Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? State citizenship is a vested substantial property right, and the state has no power to divest or impair these rights. The state citizen is immune from any and all government attacks and procedure absent contract. Every man is independent of all laws except those prescribed by nature. He's not bound by any institutions formed by his fellow men without his consent. Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? The rights of the individual are restricted only to the extent that they have been voluntarily surrendered by citizenship to the agencies of government. Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? It will be admitted on all hands that with the exception of the powers granted to the states and the federal government through the constitutions, the people of the several states are unconditionally sovereign within their respective states. A sovereign is exempt from suit not because of any formal conception or obsolete theory, but on the logical and practical ground that there can be no legal right as against the authority which makes the law on which the right depends. Did you give up your God-given right for some satanic privileges? What that second case is saying, basically, there's court cases to say that we the people delegate. The only power that the government has is delegated. And can I delegate to, to some guy down the street to go to some other guy and take his property? No, I cannot. And so, therefore, um, the government, I cannot delegate to the government authority to do anything to me. If there's anything that happens to me, if I murder somebody, it has to be a jury of my peers that will get together and put me on trial and do whatever needs to be done. Okay, that's where it's got to come from. It cannot be the government. It's got to be common law. That's the jury of my peers. At the revolution, the sovereignty devolved on the people, and they are truly the sovereigns of the country. The citizens of America are equal as fellow citizens and as joint tenants in the sovereignty. Did you give up your God-given rights for some satanic privileges? People of a state uh, are entitled to all the rights which formerly belong to the king by his prerogative. See the do it, uh, do you know who you are playlist. Eliminating then from the opinions of this court all expressions unnecessary to the disposition of the particular case and gleaning therefrom the exact point decided in each, the following propositions may be considered as established. Number one, that the District of Columbia and the territories are not states within the judicial clause of the Constitution, giving jurisdiction in cases between citizens of different states. Number three, that the District of Columbia and the territories are not states, as that word is used in treaties, are states. I'm sorry. The District of Columbia and the territories are states, as that word is used in treaties with foreign powers with respect to the ownership, disposition, and inheritance of property. And number four, that the territories are not within the clause of the Constitution providing for the creation of a Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress may see fit to establish. So, 
It's saying, first of all, that the D.C. and the territories do not get Article Three courts. We already talked about that in some other court cases. The D.C. and the territories are states as far as international treaties are concerned. And, uh, and, and the respect to ownership, disposition, and inheritance of property. That's talking about the Sestake Trust. That the territories are not within the clause of the Constitution providing for the creation of the Supreme Court and such inferior courts. There's no courts in the territories. Okay? That's exactly what it's saying. There's no courts. If you think about it, it's all their kangaroo courts. Nothing to do with the United Nations has anything to do with state citizens. Okay? Did you give up? Your God-given rights for some satanic privileges. The UN, that's why they have to establish that you're a U.S. citizen or a resident alien. The UN doesn't have a, sh a shred of authority over state citizens. United States participation in United Nations only applies to U.S. citizens. There is no real courts in the District of Columbian Territory. There's only kangaroo courts. It's a sham legal proceeding. It's, it's a term descriptive of a sham legal proceeding in which the person's rights are totally disregarded, in which the result is a foregone conclusion because of the bias of the court or other tribunal. It's a kangaroo court. That's all they have in D.C. and the territories. If you're a U.S. citizen, that's all you get. That's the best you can do. You can beg for forgiveness. That's it. You're a slave. You're a piece of property. And they're going to sell you into slavery under their unidroit, satanic unidroit, uniform commercial code. That's where it's all going, folks. And the sooner we wake up to it and the sooner we walk away from this U.S. citizen slave, the better. And, uh, and if enough of us get together, then we can take our government back. Right now, it's owned and operated by the Roman cult. Anyways, thanks for watching. Um, I appreciate you watching. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, I hope... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, I, I try and put these things together to explain what's going on. Um, and I hope you're getting uh, what it is I'm saying. It's amazing. Some people contact me and, and they just don't get it. I, you know, I think it has something to do with maybe some drugs that people are taking, pharmaceuticals, and the, the lousy education system. Uh, but it's amazing how many people are just not getting it. And, uh, and so I'm trying to explain it in different ways. Uh, so that uh, uh, so that people will will get it hopefully when I say it in a different way. Um, anyways, thanks for watching and spread the word. Circulate this far and wide. Uh, uh, we need to educate people about this. Have a great day.